Okay, so this deep dive, we're getting into the nitty gritty of corporate training. You know, something I think we've all experienced and, well, let's just say it hasn't always been a thrilling ride. Definitely room for improvement. Big time. We're diving into the cult of performance in enterprise learning and development by Guy W. Wallace. Oh, I've heard of this one. Have you read it? I have, yeah. What'd you think? I mean, it's a bit provocative with the title. Yeah. But it really gets you thinking about how we can make training stick and actually lead to better job performance. Which is the whole point, right? I mean, nobody wants to waste their time with training that just goes in one ear and out the other. Exactly. Wallace has been in this field for over 40 years, and he's not afraid to shake things up. The title itself, The Cult of Performance, definitely makes you do a double take. Kind of intense, right? A little bit. Yeah. yeah. But it highlights how seriously we need to take performance improvement. It makes sense. One of the first things that jumped out at me was this idea of content drift. Can you uh, refresh my memory on that one? Oh, absolutely. Content drift is basically when training gets bogged down in information that's not essential for actually doing the job. Okay. So like instead of teaching me how to use the new software, they spend an hour talking about the company's history. Exactly. Or they load up the training with all sorts of interesting but ultimately irrelevant facts and figures. Ugh, I've been there. It's like, can we just cut to the chase and teach me what I need to know to do my job? That's what Wallace is advocating for, laser focus on what he calls performance-based instruction. It's about ruthlessly cutting out anything that doesn't directly contribute to someone being able to do their job better. Okay, less is more, got it. But how do we actually put this into practice? It sounds good in theory, but is there like a step-by-step -step process? There is. Wallace breaks it down into three key processes. He calls the first one instructional architecture. Okay, instructional architecture sounds a little intimidating. It's not as complicated as it sounds. Yeah. Think of it as creating a blueprint for all the training in your organization. So not just one-off workshops, but a more holistic, connected approach. Exactly. All the modules are reusable, they build on each other, and they're all working towards those same business goals. I like it. So what's next? Then you have instructional development, which is where you actually design and create the training content, but always with that performance goal in mind. So every quiz, every activity, every single piece of content, it's all geared towards helping people perform better on the job. Exactly. <laughs> it's about making sure the training translates into real world results. OK, that makes sense. And what's the third process? The third one is instructional implementation, evaluation and maintenance. Basically, it's about making sure the training is delivered effectively, that it's actually working and that it stays relevant over time. So it's not enough to just create great training. You have to make sure it's delivered well, that people are actually learning from it and that it stays up to date. Exactly. It's about taking a long term view of training and making sure it delivers a real return on investment. This is starting to sound less like a random assortment of workshops and more like a well-oiled performance enhancing machine. That's the idea. I like it. Now, there's one thing I've been curious about. Wallace talks about something called a full destructive pilot test. And honestly, it sounds a little intense. Laughing. I can see why you might say that. What it boils down to is rigorously testing the training program before you roll it out to the whole organization. So like a test run where you try to break it. Essentially. You want to identify any weaknesses, any gaps in the content, any areas where the training isn't as clear or effective as it could be, and then you refine it before it goes live. That's actually really smart. It's like putting your training through boot camp to make sure it's ready for the real world. Exactly. You want to make sure it can stand up to the demands of the job and actually deliver those performance improvements you're aiming for. This is all making a lot of sense to me. Now, I know we've just scratched the surface here, but if we had to boil down the core message of this cult of performance idea, what would you say it is? To me, it's about shifting our mindset from just delivering information to truly enabling performance change. It's not enough to just tell people stuff. We need to give them the tools, the knowledge, and the support they need to apply that information and see real results on the job. It's about moving from theory to practice, from knowledge to action. Exactly. OK, that's a great foundation. Now, let's dig a little deeper into how we actually figure out what content people need to excel in their roles. Mm. That's where the analysis comes in, right? Absolutely. Analysis is crucial. You can't just throw training at people and hope for the best. So how do we go about it? What kind of analysis are we talking about? Wallace breaks it down into four specific types of analysis, mm -hmm. and they all build on each other to create a really comprehensive picture of what needs to happen for training to be effective. Okay, I'm all ears. Lay it on me. What are these four types of analysis? 
Four types of analysis. Okay, that sounds pretty thorough. I'm guessing it all starts with the people we're trying to train? Exactly. The first analysis is all about the learners. Wallace calls it target audience analysis. Makes sense. You got to know who you're teaching. Right. It's not enough to just look at job titles. Yeah. You need to really understand their existing skills, their learning preferences, their backgrounds, even the specific challenges they face in their day-to-day -day work. So if I'm training a team of salespeople, I shouldn't assume they all need the same thing. Exactly. This? Someone might have years of experience but struggles with a certain software program, while another person is fresh out of college but a natural at building relationships. You need to tailor the training to those individual needs. It's like personalized learning, but for the workplace. Precisely. The more you know about your learners, the more effective your training will be. Okay, that makes sense. So we've analyzed our target audience. What's next? The next step is figuring out what those learners actually need to be able to do on the job. That's where the performance requirements and gap analysis comes in. Performance requirements and gap analysis. It sounds like we're setting some performance targets and then figuring out how to bridge the gap. That's a great way to put it. You need to define what good performance looks like in those specific roles and then identify the gaps between where people are now and where they need to be to meet those performance standards. So it's kind of like setting the GPS we know our destination, and now we're figuring out the best route to get there. Exactly. And just like a GPS needs to know about traffic and road closures, we need to identify any obstacles that might be preventing our learners from reaching their full potential. I like the analogy. Okay, so we know our destination. We've mapped out the route. What's the next step in our performance GPS? Now we need to give our learners the tools and knowledge they need to navigate that route. That's where the third type of analysis comes in, enabling knowledge and skills analysis. Enabling knowledge and skills analysis. So, so we're breaking down those performance requirements into the specific knowledge and skills people need to succeed. Exactly. If we're teaching someone to bake a cake, this is where we'd identify all the essential ingredients, the steps involved, the techniques they need to master. It's like providing them with the recipe for success. Exactly. We're equipping them with the knowledge and skills they need to perform at their best. Okay, that makes sense. So we've analyzed our learners, we've defined performance requirements, and we've identified the essential knowledge and skills. What's the fourth and final analysis? The fourth analysis is all about being resourceful and making sure we're not reinventing the wheel. Wallace calls it assessment of existing content and its reuse potential. Assessment of existing content and its reuse potential. So basically taking inventory of any training materials we already have and seeing if we can repurpose them. Exactly. Maybe you have existing training modules, job aids, presentations, or even just internal documents that contain valuable information. This is your chance to see what you can salvage and reuse rather than starting from scratch. That's really smart, especially with tight budgets and limited resources. It makes sense to leverage what you already have. Right. And it can save a lot of time and effort in the long run. But isn't this where that content drift idea could creep back in? I mean, just because we have existing materials doesn't mean they're all good or even relevant. That's a valid concern. Yeah. That's why this assessment is so important. You need to be really critical and make sure that any content you reuse is truly aligned with those specific performance goals you've defined. So we're bringing back that laser focus, making sure everything we use is serving a specific purpose. Exactly. No fluff, no filler, just the essential knowledge and skills people need to excel in their roles. Now, I'm guessing all this analysis shouldn't happen in a vacuum. We don't want to be stuck in an ivory tower coming up with training that's completely out of touch with reality. We need to involve the people who are actually doing these jobs, right? You're spot on. Wallace is a huge advocate for involving subject matter experts throughout this entire analysis process. And by subject matter experts, we mean the folks who are in the trenches, the ones who are actually doing the work day in and day out. Exactly. They're the ones with the first-hand experience, the practical insights, the tips and tricks that you won't find in any textbook. They can tell you what works, what doesn't, and what they wish they knew when they were starting out. Precisely. Their input is invaluable. By tapping into their knowledge and experience, you can ensure that your training is grounded in real-world practices and challenges. So we've done our analysis, mm -hmm. we've involved the experts, we've got a mountain of insights. Now what? Time to start building the training, right? You got it. And this is where Wallace encourages us to think outside the traditional death by PowerPoint approach. Okay, I'm intrigued. What does he suggest instead? He advocates for what he calls the event, lesson, and instructional activity framework. 
Basically, it's about breaking down the training into smaller, more digestible chunks. So instead of one massive, overwhelming training session, it's a series of more focused and engaging learning events. Exactly. Each event has a clear objective and builds upon the previous one. It's about creating a more structured and progressive learning journey. That makes a lot of sense. I know I retain information so much better when it's presented in bite-sized pieces rather than one massive info dump. Exactly. It's much easier to digest and remember. And within each of these events or modules, Wallace emphasizes the importance of incorporating three key types of learning activities. Okay, hit me with it. What are these three types? First, you have information. This is where you're presenting the core concepts, the facts, the procedures, whatever knowledge is essential for that particular module. So the what and the why. Exactly. But it's not enough to just tell people stuff. You need to show them how it's done in practice. That's where demonstration comes in. So think live demos, role-playing, simulations, things like that. Exactly. You're bringing those concepts to life and showing people how they're actually applied in a real-world setting. Okay, that makes sense. So we've got the information, we've seen it in action. What's the third type? The third and arguably most important time is application. This is where learners actually get to practice what they've learned. So think hands-on activities, group exercises, case studies, that kind of thing. Exactly. You're giving them a safe space to experiment, to make mistakes, and to really internalize those new skills. It's like learning to ride a bike. You can read all the books and watch all the videos you want, but until you actually hop on that bike and start pedaling, you're not really going to learn. Exactly. Experience is the best teacher. And by incorporating all three of these elements, information, demonstration, and application, you create a much more well-rounded and effective learning experience. I love that. So we're moving away from passive learning and towards a more active and engaging approach. Precisely. It's about empowering learners to take ownership of their development and to apply what they're learning in a meaningful way. This is all making so much sense. Now, we can't talk about learning and development these days without addressing the elephant in the room, artificial intelligence. It seems like AI is popping up everywhere and everyone's got an opinion on it. I'm curious to know, how does Wallace see AI fitting into this whole performance-based training model? It's a great question and one that a lot of people are grappling with right now. Wallace definitely doesn't shy away from it. In fact, he dedicates a whole section of his book to exploring the potential of AI in corporate training. Oh, interesting. So is he all in on the AI bandwagon? Does he think robots are going to be replacing trainers anytime soon? Not quite. He's yeah. cautiously optimistic, I'd say. He definitely sees the potential of AI to enhance training, but he also emphasizes the importance of human expertise. So it's not a question of AI versus humans. It's about finding the right balance, the right way to leverage AI to enhance human capabilities. Exactly. For example, AI can be great for automating certain tasks like curating content, providing personalized recommendations, or even delivering basic training modules. So it can free up human trainers to focus on more high-value activities like coaching, mentoring, and facilitating group discussions. Precisely. But when it comes to things like critical thinking, problem solving, emotional intelligence, those uniquely human skills, mm. that's where human expertise is still irreplaceable. So it's about using AI strategically to enhance, not replace, the human element in training. Exactly. And that brings us to what I think is a key distinction in Wallace's approach. He's not just focused on knowledge acquisition. He's focused on actual performance change. Right. It's not enough to just stuff people's heads with information. They need to be able to apply that knowledge and see a real difference in how they do their jobs. Exactly. And that's why Wallace stresses moving away from the one and done training approach. Hmm. We need to provide ongoing support and reinforcement to help people truly integrate those new skills to their daily routines. So no more attending a day-long workshop and then forgetting everything a week later. Exactly. We need to create a culture of continuous learning where people are constantly growing and evolving their skills. And that's probably where that content drift and cognitive overload we talked about earlier become even more important to avoid. Absolutely. If you bombard people with too much information all at once, it's just not going to stick. You need to provide information and support in a more measured and targeted way. It's like watering a plant with a fire hose. Hmm. You're just going to drown it. You need to give it the right amount of water at the right time. Exactly. And that's where coaching comes in. Wallace sees coaching as a vital part of this performance-based framework, not just an optional add-on. Okay, let's dive into that a bit. What does effective coaching look like in this context? It's about embedding coaching into the training design itself and having coaches who understand both the material and the specific challenges their learners are facing. So 
Not just any manager can be a coach. They need to have a deep understanding of the skills being taught and how those skills translate to real-world job performance. Exactly. And effective coaching isn't about simply telling people what to do or correcting their mistakes. It's about asking the right questions, providing targeted feedback, and empowering learners to take ownership of their development. It's about guiding them towards those aha moments where they connect the dots between the training and their own work. Exactly. Wallace even provides some practical tools and techniques to help structure those coaching conversations, give constructive feedback, and track progress over time. So it's a very deliberate and structured approach to coaching, not just winging it. Precisely. And as learners progress through the training and beyond, ongoing evaluation and continuous improvement are crucial. So we're not just evaluating the training program itself, but also tracking the impact it's having on individual and organizational performance. Absolutely. And this isn't about collecting data for the sake of it. It's about using that data to make informed decisions, to refine the training, to make sure it's still relevant and delivering those desired results. It's about creating a feedback loop to make sure the training stays agile and adapts to the ever-changing needs of the organization. Exactly. And that ongoing evaluation process extends to the coaching component as well. Mm -hmm. Are those coaching conversations actually leading to improvements? Are there any gaps in the support being provided? It's about holding everyone accountable, both the learners and the coaches, to make sure this performance-based ecosystem is truly thriving. Precisely. By consistently analyzing this data, you can pinpoint areas for improvement, make adjustments, and ensure that the training continues to deliver on its promise of real, tangible performance change. So it's this continuous cycle, design, development, implementation, evaluation, refinement, always with that focus on achieving those desired outcomes. Exactly. And what I find fascinating is that Wallace doesn't just stop at the what and how of performance-based training. He also digs into the why. The why. Now you've got me curious. What's his take on that? He argues that it's about more than just individual or even organizational performance for its own sake. He believes that when done right, performance-based training can actually have a profound impact on an organization's culture. Now that's interesting. How so? By shifting the focus from just delivering information to truly empowering employees to perform at their best, you create a culture of continuous learning, accountability, and excellence. It's about creating an environment where people feel valued, supported, and empowered to grow their skills. It's not just about the bottom line, though. That's certainly a nice bonus. It's about building a workplace where people are engaged, motivated, and fulfilled by their work. Exactly. And that, I believe, is the true power of performance-based training. It has the potential to transform not just individual employees, but the very fabric of an organization. That's a powerful statement. This has definitely given me a lot to chew on, especially when it comes to the cult of performance idea. As I was reading, I got the feeling that Wallace isn't advocating for this cutthroat, performance-at-all-costs mentality. It's not about pushing people to burn out or fostering a hyper-competitive environment, right? You hit the nail on the head. It's about creating a culture of performance that's both ambitious and sustainable, one that pushes people to grow while also respecting their individual needs and limits. So what's the real message behind the cult of performance? What's that word supposed to evoke for readers? I think Wallace is urging us to move away from simply staying busy and towards focusing on outcomes. It's about aligning our efforts with what truly matters, achieving meaningful results. It's about discipline, focus, and a commitment to excellence. It's about working smarter, not harder, and making sure our efforts contribute to the greater goals of the organization. Exactly. And it's also about recognizing that everyone has different strengths, and true success lies in leveraging those individual talents to achieve shared goals. It's about building a high-performing team where everyone feels valued and supported. Precisely. And I think that's a cult worth belonging to. This has been incredibly eye-opening. But before we wrap up, there's one more thing I wanted to touch on. This idea of performance-based training, it sounds great in theory, but what about the practical side? What advice does Wallace offer for actually putting these ideas into action? It's one thing to talk about it, but how do we actually make it happen? Does Wallace offer any concrete guidance? He does, yeah. He lays out a really practical roadmap with tools and techniques that organizations can use to implement this whole performance-based approach. Well, it's not just theory. He gives you the actionable steps. Exactly. Like, remember those four types of analysis we talked about? He actually provides templates and frameworks to guide you through each one. Oh, that's helpful. So you don't have to start from scratch. Exactly. No. And it's not just about the analysis. 
He offers guidance on designing the training itself, like how to make it engaging, how to incorporate those adult learning principles we talked about, even how to use technology effectively. So everything from crafting learning objectives to choosing the right delivery method, he's got you covered. <laughs> exactly. He really walks you through the whole process. And when it comes to actually putting the training into practice, he stresses the importance of getting buy-in from key stakeholders. Right. It can't just be an HR initiative. Everyone needs to be on board. Exactly. Especially the leaders. They need to understand the value of this approach and champion it throughout the organization. That makes sense. And once the training is up and running, we need to make sure it's actually working, right? That's where the evaluation comes in. Exactly. And Wallace provides really clear guidance on how to evaluate the effectiveness of your training, both in terms of individual performance and organizational impact. So we're not just measuring how well people like the training, we're measuring its actual impact on the bottom line. Exactly. It's about looking at those key performance indicators and seeing if the training is moving the needle. And if it's not, then we go back to the drawing board. Exactly. Remember that feedback loop we talked about? It's yeah. all about continuous improvement, constantly assessing and adjusting to make sure your training is delivering those desired outcomes. This has been such an insightful deep dive. I feel like I've gone from dreading corporate training to actually being excited about its potential. Me too. Yeah. It's easy to get cynical based on our past experiences, but Wallace's approach is really refreshing. It's about seeing training not as a chore, but as an investment. An investment in your people, in their growth, and ultimately in the success of the organization. Couldn't say it better myself. So if you're ready to ditch those tired old training methods and embrace a more impactful results-driven approach, I highly recommend checking out The Cult of Performance. Absolutely. It's a must read for anyone involved in learning and development or anyone who wants to see real change in their organization. Well, that's it for this deep dive into the world of performance-based training. We hope you found it insightful and maybe even a little inspiring. We'll be back next week with another deep dive into a new topic. Not just then, keep learning, keep growing, and keep striving for excellence in all that you do. Mm -hmm.